Hello, everyone. My guest today is Steve Hartert. He is the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer at JotForm.com with responsibility for marketing programs, brand management, and corporate partnerships. Prior to joining JotForm, he was president of Hartert and Associates, a marketing consultancy that worked with B2B and B2C companies. Steve has more than 25 years of marketing management experience. Steve, are you ready to take us to the top? Yes, I am. Let's go. All right. So JotForm gave you a big, juicy chunk of equity to convince you to leave your own company and join them, right? Yes, they, yes, they did. Yeah. <laughs> tell, us what, a, tell us what JotForm does and what's the revenue model? How do you make money? Sure. I mean, what we are is we're online form builder. Um, you know, previous to our system, <clears throat> if you wanted to build a build forms, you had to be a programmer. You had to be a coder. And forms can be quite complicated. What we, what we developed was the very first drag and drop interface as a SaaS product where somebody could just literally say, I want these fields. I want first name, last name. I want address. I want, I want to get a payment or whatever other fields they want. And they can create online forms. It's very simple, very, very easy to do. And what's the business model? Is it a SaaS play? Yes, we're very much a SaaS play. What we have is we have a free product so people can test drive it as long as they want. But as they, you know, as their needs grow and they need more forms or they need more features, we have tiered paid products that appeal to various levels of companies. That's great. And give us a sense. I don't want to go down every single cohort because I'm sure you have many. What's the average customer paying you per month, would you say? Uh, the average customer in our product line starts at $19 a month for our bronze plan and they go all the way up to $99 for our gold plan. Uh, but right now we've got probably... Our average cost or average revenue per user is probably somewhere in the uh, mid 20s because we've got a pretty good mix of people. Okay, that's fair enough. That's good to understand. And then help us understand how you got involved with the company. I was joking when we started, but the company was launched in what year and when did you join and why? Sure. The company was launched in 2006. Um, and I think what's unique about Jotform is we've been a bootstrap company since day one. We've never wow. taken one dime Still of today. DC money. Still today, still today. We've never taken one dime of any investor money. It has been the company has grown organically, and that's just how we're going to continue to, to work it. We have no plans to take any kind of money from any investors at this point. Uh, where I came into the picture was about two years ago, ID Can Tank, our CEO, uh, approached me and kind of laid out the jot form story, told me where the company had been, where he would like to take the company, and basically uh, made such a compelling story to me and, you know, told me such a, where they wanted to, you know, really the future where they wanted to go. It was very difficult to say no. And, and I thought, and I talked it over with my family and we said, you know, it's one of these opportunities that come along probably once in a lifetime. And if you're going to jump and grab that ring, now's the time to do it. And, and here we are. Now you joined, you know, eight or nine, almost nine years after launch, were you still able to, re I mean, did he incentivize you? Do you have at least some equity in the company? Mm -hmm. You have some of the upside or no? Yes. Yes. He did give me some equity. He was very generous in the equity. Um, so that, you know, obviously that's very helpful when you want to sit there and keep building a company. But, uh, you know, it was also, he gave me the challenge. He gives me the freedom. Um, and he, as he does everybody here, I think really, um, to kind of just do it the way you think you need to do it. Um, he, he, you know, we're not my, no one in this company is micromanaged. We try to be a very, how many are you? Structure. We are about 75 people in total. And, and that's, in, you know, that's a mix of programmers, support people, uh, the, the marketing team, obviously, and such like that. So, all in San got, Fran? No, we've got people actually based all over the world. We've got, a, we've got our headquarters is based here in San Francisco, but we also have a programming group that's based out of Ankara, Turkey. We have support people all over the the country or actually all over the country and all over the world so we can provide 24 7 support to our users um just to kind of give you an idea of the size of the company and where our footprint's at um, we have users in about 192 different countries around the globe so just about every you know just about every piece of dirt on the on the planet we we've got a role in it somehow uh, we this in a couple of uh, I think it was in September maybe it was October early October we crossed the three million user mark for the first time which is phenomenal growth for us and uh, you know I mean we just don't see any end in sight to where we're, where this company is headed that's great and what have you grown to now over the two years you've been there what are you guys at now right now in terms of total customers using, using you guys I mean total customers the growth has been over fifty percent when I came on board. We had just crossed the 2 million mark. So it took us about 10 years to go from zero to 2 million users. And in really the last 18, 19 months, we've been able to add 50% more user base. And our, you know, we're actually in that 
if you look at our growth, it was very slow and steady. And then for the last, you know, say 18 months, it's climbing big time. So that's, the hockey stick is starting to very much happen for us. That's great. I want to talk more about that. But just to be clear, all of those 3 million are paying, they're all paying customers or they're just free users? There's a mix of paid and used. Okay. Uh, paid and free, I should say. Paid and free. Okay. Can you give us a general idea of how many folks are actually paying for the platform? Uh, that one, I'm going to have to kind of hold that card fairly close, but it's a, it's we're above industry average. Let's just put it that way. Okay. And you'll have to educate us because I just don't know. what is, I mean, is industry average 5% of users, 10%, 20% of users paying? It's a it's about six and a half to seven percent as average, and when you have a freemium model like what we have, uh-huh. uh, but I say our user base, our paid user base, is, is beyond that. Okay, that's great. And where, um, how do you get that average number? What, who are you comparing yourselves to there? Uh, really, we're comparing ourselves to other SaaS companies. Or when you know we did some research, and you look at what other SaaS companies are that offer the same kind of freemium model that we do, um, that's really where we fall into place. And we went, oh, it's great. You know, we're above where that industry average would be at. That's great. And see, I want to give you credit where credit's due. So hopefully, this doesn't make you nervous. But you know, at, at a minimum, if you're beating six percent, you got three million users. You have over one hundred eighty thousand paying folks, right? And if they're paying an average of twenty five per month, you guys are doing well north of four point five million bucks a month. Is that generally fair to say? Yeah, I would say that's pretty, yeah, okay, you're pretty that, much in the ballpark. Okay, good. That's healthy. That's good to understand. Now, you're CMO. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a very, it's right. a it's a very competitive space. And by competitive, I mean keywords for anything related to form are very expensive to buy. How are you acquiring customers? You've got to get creative, I imagine. Yeah, we do. I mean, we use multiple different channels to get to, to get our customer base growing. I mean, what we have found works very well for us, again, is the keyword. Our SEO um, works quite well. We have a tremendous growth in our organic search. Um, and that's really where people find us. And we've been very, very deliberate in how we structure that. Um, so what we found is by addressing specific challenges that companies face and, and using that as our foundation on the SEO, that's where we're finding the growth is coming from because people have a particular problem that they're trying to solve and they pop it up and we show up as that solution and then they sign up and we're off and running at that point. How do you discover more terms people are searching for that your product helps them solve? We constantly look at, I mean, there's a lot of different ways we do it. One is we talk to our customers all the time. So we're constantly serving them to find out what they liked about us, how they find us, what were they trying to solve or what problem they were trying to solve. And then we also just look at general search terms where you will go in there and just do search terms on our own to see what pops up. So we might do something else to say, I need a, a contact form or I need an online contact form. And we will see what shows up as far as, is that one of our competitors? Is it something completely random that you know no one ever knew about? And so when we, we structure it that way, you start to, you, the picture starts to develop and show you wh- where that path is at and which way you need to go with it. And <clears throat> if you kind of back into today, what you're paying to acquire a customer, or maybe not what you're actually paying, but a different question is, what are you willing to pay to acquire a customer currently? I mean, really what we're willing to pay is, you know, I think we would go as high as maybe 20 to $30 per acquisition for a paid customer. Uh, but we're not paying anything near that, to be honest with you. Um, because again, because the way our, the model works for us when they come in and they will, st- and they will generally come in as, as a free user to start with, we do get a certain percentage that come paid right off the gate, but we get a certain percentage that will come in as a free user. And then when they, st- they will stick around as a free user, probably for say six to eight weeks, maybe nine months, maybe 90 days, and then they start to see the value and their needs grow. And then at that point, it's like, well, I need the I need to purchase the product because I need additional forms or I need more form submissions or I need additional features. Maybe they want to take more online payments, something along those lines. And then from that point, then they come on. And then the long term, the long term of a customer for us is and we measure that in years. How many years do you assume they stick with you usually? Um, our, according to our measurements, we have an average of uh, right around three years. Okay. That's what a paid customer. So you can see if we were looking to go in as high as $20 an acquisition cost or maybe in $30 an acquisition cost, and we're multiplying, say, even if they came in at the low rate at $19 a month times 36 months, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, you're, and let's just use the $25 number since that's your average. That's $900 in lifetime value across three years. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. And so just to confirm, it's fair to say you're spending significantly less than 20 bucks to acquire a new customer. Exactly. Okay. And uh, your payback period is obviously healthy. In this kind of space, I've heard sometimes churn is difficult, right? High volume, low ARPU. Um, what is your guys' annual churn right now? And what are you doing to drive that down? Yeah, the churn, I mean, we, we've been studying our churn for the last, really since I came on board. And what I'm looking at on the churn, our churn rates are 
probably, I wouldn't say they're average. They're average for our space. We want them to go lower. We're Educate us average. to see. What is that? Yeah, I think this, in the space itself, it's around 5%. It's probably your typical, yeah, actually 5 to 7%, I would say, probably your typical churn. And that's We're logo kinda, churn monthly? That's, that's actually, that's, that's the monthly churn. But on logo or revenue? On, that's, just, uh, that's users. The revenue, the revenue churn is, is almost insignificant, to be honest with you. Because it's all the um, same price point. You don't have a lot of expansion ARPU. Right, exactly. So we're looking at, I mean, when we're looking at what, what the causes of our churn are, is we've been able to identify some very specific causes of what's, what's driving our churn rate. And we're actually going to be developed. We've got a plan in place that we're going to start putting out in the next, really next probably two months that we think is really going to significantly drive that down. Come and on, so, Steve, you're teasing me. What's the plan? Uh, the plan really is to, is, we're, is to head off the problems before they pop up. Um, <clears throat> we have found what's really probably the biggest driver for us is when people have uh, their, their credit cards expire. Right. I mean, people just forget to do payment. And we've identified that and went, wait a second, these people are just forgetting to update their payment. And so that's causing them to fall out. And by identifying that group earlier on, we're able to sit there. We did a test on that and we found, yes, when we alert them and say, did you know your payment's going to expire? Now we're finding that those people go, oh, I wasn't aware of that. And then they go ahead and then they update their payments and they stay on as a paying customer so that that churn element does not happen. I can't say that this has been done or that I've done it or anyone I know has done it because I have no idea if it's legal or not. But in their general idea of breaking rules, I mean, many people, the most successful churn reduction they've had in this kind of at this kind of price point when they realized the expiration date was the biggest issue, which 60, 70 percent of churn sometimes is just actually guessing. Right. The new updated year of the expiration has significantly driven that down. Now you can do that in a variety of different kind of ways in terms of doing it the right way, or the wrong way, but it makes complete sense why that's what you're focused on. Right. Right. And again, and that's what we identified as, as probably our biggest piece of churn. Yeah. And by looking at that going, well, we know because when somebody signs up, we understand what their payment process is because we, when they sign up, but we get their expiration dates on their credit cards. And so what we've done is we just flagged it to say, okay, now starting at you know, if somebody's going to expire, say, January 1, 2018, we're recording this here on December 1st, we would start sending those people out notices now to say, you need to update your payment. Yep. yep. And guys, you just heard kind of the recording date. And remember, I do so many of these interviews. If you want to not have to wait, you're probably hearing this in March. If you want to not have to wait so long, you can go to gitlatka.com where I publish them instantly. So just to, just to call out there to check that out. Now, Steve, the uh, the last question I have for you before we wrap up with the famous five Um usage metrics that you know tie directly to increased lifetime value you want to push forward in the onboarding as much as possible what is the number one thing you know you have to get new users to do in the first seven days to make them significantly more sticky right i think for us it's engagement um it's to actually they'll sign up for the product we want them to actually start using the product more than just i want to create a basic form and okay. so we have found that the, the more engagement we can get with a user to say, hey, did you know? Yes, uh, most of them will come in and want to create a simple contact form. But when we when we show them how to create, say, an online payment form or how to create an online survey or how to make a ex more extensive kind of form that uses things like conditional logic, when they start to see the sophistication that the product actually has, that's when the stickiness factor suddenly comes in the, into play. And that's when those customers will be much more of a long-term customer than a short-term customer. How do you know whether to focus your energy on like them just getting the form, like them just logging on them, the, them just getting <clears throat> the first form created them actually launching and embedding their first form, them actually getting 20 new opt-ins to the form. Like, how do you know which of these points you should put most of your resources to? Yeah, we've done, I mean, our, our metrics team is incredible and they do fantastic work and we've actually been able to look at so many of our new users to see what that usage pattern is when they come on board. And so we identified if somebody came in and just created a simple form, kind of like create it and then walked away, we found that the engagement fell off immediately. But we found that by going in there and continually to educate those users in that first 10 days of them as a new user, that, that basically, did you know you could do this? Did you know you could do that with a job form? Here's how you do it. We found that by showing them a path of how to do it, significantly improve the engagement and those customers then create more forms and then we start to become a much bigger piece of their daily workflow as a company. Makes a lot of sense. Let's uh, wrap up here in a second, Steve, with the Famous Five. Last question. You mentioned about 
12 months ago, you were at about 2 million free users. You've grown significantly since then up to three. Um, is that also translating to revenue? In other words, are you, are you, you're not seeing decreased conversion, right? As you increase volume of new free, are you? No, I've actually seen an increase in conversions, which is, which is great. That's exactly what we wanted to see. I mean, if you look back again over the history of the company, the conversion rate stayed at a very specific level, but in the last 12 months, that conversion level has started to climb. And so for us, it's a matter, we know that the more customers we can get in now, we can, the percentage that we're going to convert over is growing. Yep. And, and just to be clear, you said you're, you're beating industry average of 6%. I mean, we can say between six and 15% somewhere in there. Right. Okay. Exactly. And, and if you've grown by a third over the past 12 months, I mean, if you're at, you know, above 4.5 million a month today, go back 12 months, you guys were doing what, two, nine, something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. In that general range. Healthy growth, Steve, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Um, probably my most famous business or my favorite business book is going to be the Steve Jobs bio by Walter Isaacson. No. Um, it's a good one. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Uh, probably Tim Cook. I, I, he's a very fascinating individual and, um, yeah, he's a very interesting person to follow. Number three, is there, besides your own, what's your favorite online tool? Twitter. <laughs> Number four, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Uh, about five. Okay. And what's your situation? Married, single, you have kiddos? Uh, uh, girlfriend. Girlfriend and any kids or no? Oh uh, yeah. My, my kids are older. They're in their in, uh, mid, mid to late twenties now, if you can believe That's that. That's great. And how many? I have two boys. Two. And how old are you, Steve? Uh, <laughs> I am 57 years 57 old. 57 years young. Last question. Take us back 37 years. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? I wish my 20 year old self knew, um, probably had a better sense of direction and where to go. Um, I think, you know, if I had spent a little bit more time paying attention to my finance classes in college, um, I would have saved myself a whole lot of grief early in my career. There you guys have it from Steve. He wishes he would have spent more time understanding finances earlier on in his career, was doing his own thing. And then the jot form crew came along and said, Steve, you have to join. Here's a big juicy deal. He does back about two years ago. Now Jotform is growing, launched in 2006. They've passed over 3 million free users, well over 6% of those paying. So they've grown over the past 12 months from about 2.9 million bucks a month in revenue generally to over 4.5 million. Steve's driving churn down from 5% monthly logo churn, focused on driving that down. Super healthy economics right now. They're spending less than 20 bucks to acquire new customers with a 36 month lifetime value at 25 bucks a month. That's 900 bucks in LTV. Again, less than 20 bucks in CAC, so healthy there. Payback period happens in the first month, which is great. Their team of 75 based in San Francisco go in their remote offices, focused on making online forms significantly easier. Steve, thank you for taking us to the top. Oh, thanks for, uh, thanks for the opportunity.